Welcome to the Think Fitness Life Podcast, where we bring the mind, body, and gym together so you can improve your health, increase performance, and live your best life. For more information, visit thinkfitnesslife.com. Here are your hosts, Matt Gluckman and Eric Menchie. We are live. Eric and myself again, Matt Gluckman with Think Fitness Life. Today, we're going to be talking about exercising after injury or exercising during an injury or overcoming chronic pain. It's kind of all the same sides or different sides of the same coin in terms of, you know, identifying your, the, the pain and then kind of reestablishing mobility and movement patterns so that you can get better neuromuscular firing and not result in pain, right? And the goal is to strengthen so that you're not in pain. And the best way to do that is the first exercise without pain. But I won't let Eric kind of start here a little bit in terms of most common injuries. Well, I'd say first off, the most common injuries are lower back issues. And I guess first off is there's difference between injuries and pain. And I think there mm. needs to be a differentiation between the two, because if you're seriously injured, you're going to have some sort of acute damage. Now you can still be injured and have pain and vice versa, but it's not going to be one of those that are like lingering. I mean, I always assimilate when it comes to our athletes or my clients and injury is, is a torn ligament, is a torn tissue, is something that yeah. is abruptly disturbed in the system where a, let's say a compensatory pain or a tight tissue that's giving a perception of pain is completely different and it's not really an injury. So and then on the lines of that, think like your itises, your tendonitis, your bursitis. I really don't consider those injuries. I consider those more on the compensatory pattern side of your overusing a muscle. Now, yes, you can have overuse injuries, but I always like to diff to have people understand that there definitely has to be a difference between you're injured or you're hurt. Because I remember my, one of my football coaches way back then be like, hey, if you're injured, that means you can't play. If you're hurt, mm -hmm. that means you can manage it. And we are always hurt most of the time. As athletes, as humans, we <laughs> get tight, we get you know toned up, we run into issues, we get bruised, we get bumped. It might not even be in the weight room or sports. It might just be something that you know you walk in and stub your toe yeah you're hurt but you're not injured it's not going to limit you and first of all i think that's a big thing for a lot of my athletes is that psyche of you might be injured or hurt but you're not like it's not going to stop you or slow you down and a lot of times when we do have injured athletes the first thing they do oh i'm injured i can't do anything mm -hmm. well it depends on what's injured if you have one leg that's injured yeah, you better damn right we're working out the other leg and getting some upper body work in and still pushing because taking away a person from what they do is not a good thing. If I'm injured and you take away a weight room from me, my psyche is not going to like that. And from a mental health standpoint, for a lot of athletes returning to play, it's a no-go. And I assimilate that to the general population too. You can't take away something that they like to do. If they like to ski, you got to let them have that. You can't say, hey, you can never do this again because you're injured. No, it's not good. So to understand if you're injured, you have a damaged tissue or damaged bone or whatever, there's way to rehab that and get back to your sport, to, to get back to fitness, to get back to your lifestyle. And I think that's an important thing is to tell people that you're going to work through this. If someone has lower back pain, one of the most common things we see in the gym I'm not one to go away from that lower back. And years ago, when I first started out, I'd be like, okay, we got to take away all the exercises that lower back potential. And I tell my clients, you need to figure out how to engage your glutes, your abs, your hamstrings, your quads to stabilize the lower back. Or we're going to run into the same problem over and over again because you're not changing anything by avoiding it. If I want to get good at long division, Am I going to go just do multiplication all the time? No. And I think that's where a lot of athletes and people go wrong with their programming or their return to play protocol, if we like to call it. They avoid 
what's bothering them instead of addressing it right off the bat. When you address things off the bat and start to ease back into it with moving patterns and allowing certain muscles to fire, you're going to get the best results. And usually with injury, that's what happens. If you're injured a tissue, there's a disconnect between the neuromuscular and system and the firing pattern. You need to restore that through multiple different ways. I want to unpack a few things. I love that you started off with differentiating between injury and pain, because I think so many people, and as a coach, as a trainer, like when someone tells you they're hurt or they're feeling pain, you know, you do have to first, first thing is to just pause and dive into it a little further and get, get a little bit more nuanced because you know how many times that people tell me like, ow, ow, that hurts. I'm like, you know, once I've gotten more established, like, okay, is it a joint or is it a muscle? Like, oh yeah, the muscle is burning. This is, this is a hard exercise. I'm like, geez, give me like kind of a minor heart attack, you know? But then, yeah, like a, an injury is true ligament, tendon, muscle, tissue damage. And, you know, I think when we think of falling on the ground and scraping our knee, we, we sometimes think of that as an injury or like even bruising. Like I've seen, I've seen people like, but knees together in a sporting event. And then every time that athlete goes in steps, they're feeling pain. Now, did they do any injury, any tissue damage? Not like 99% of the case, probably not. They probably just did bruising and they're feeling that bruising every time they go to put pressure on that side. So it makes them really fearful and afraid because we have a survival bias. It's a good thing that we are afraid of pain to, that it could stop us from getting to that injury. But what we need to do is treat that as a, a, a signal, which it is, a, of how to improve that. So, you know, where I'm going with this is, let's say, let's work with lower back pain for a second. And let's say that I go and pick something up. And every time I go to hinge, which is essentially picking something up off the ground, I'm hinging at my, at my belly line, my waistline here. And I'm, I'm actually just using my lumbar spine vertebrae to flex and extend, and I'm not actually flexing at the hips. So now I'm, I'm here, here it is. I did, I've been doing this bad movement pattern so many times. And then I did it one time that got me injured. Well, now I actually have like a little alarm system in my brain. You can think of the game operation. So now if I'm going to try to retrain this movement pattern up and I feel pain, I'm doing it wrong. So how can I do this movement pattern and not feel my lower back? And that's when you get into the reprogramming of your neuromuscular system and relearning different patterns so that you're getting out of pain. It does you no good to play through the pain just because it's not that intense, but eventually it is going to be that intense. So I think, yeah, that, that's where I want to kind of take things a little bit is giving people real solutions that they can use to overcome hurt and not an injury. I think that's a really clear distinction because we're not necessarily going to, there could be something more serious going on. You may have to get checked by a professional. You may have to get an MRI or an x-ray or something to really see the, the true damage that's going on. But if you're just having hurt or, or a familiar pain that has come about over and over, because, oh, I squatted again, I feel this hip pain. And every time I go to this weight, and that's different. That's more of a hurt that we can overcome with different patterning with different activation exercises and different bulk strength, like strengthening exercises so that we're strengthening the, the strong muscles in the right movement patterns. And even if you do have an injury, a perceived injury, now we always say you have to go see a professional first, go get it cleared, get an MRI, get an x-ray, consult a doctor, because most of the time what happens, you go to a doctor and they're going to say, okay, you have this. It, let's say it's an ACL tear. We'll go kind of to the extreme here. You have to get surgery. You have to go to PT. A lot of these techniques and exercises are going to be done in PT. So these will kind of have a lot of carryover. Now, this is not saying that if you have an ACL tear that, you know, this is going to replace not having that repaired. There are some surgeries or some injuries that you don't need surgery for that you can right. kind of, as we're older, a lot of times right nowadays, if you tear an ACL and you're, I think it's 35 plus, they're not going to advise you to get surgery unless you really need that ACL, but you can manage not having an ACL 
by doing a lot of these techniques and these movement patterns to help you recover. Because a lot of the times after someone goes to PT, that's when they come to see us where it's okay. Hey, I need retraining. PT is only going to go so far because they're going to give you baseline exercise. And one of the whole goals of Western PT is to get you out of pain. Once you're out of pain, Hey, guess what? The insurance companies don't care about you anymore. They're just going to be like, all right, yeah. you're done. We can discharge you. Here's your exercises. Go. And, and most of the time, within six months, that person's back in PT because they didn't follow the exercise program or wasn't efficient enough. And that's where I always get frustrated because generic PT, without understanding human biomechanics, a movement is not a movement. You can't just perform a squat in any way and expect the muscles to fire. It's yeah. the F word. You have to feel things. And if you don't, you're wasting time. And there might be people listening that are going to PT right now. And I'm going to tell you, if you don't feel muscles working together, you are 100% wasting your time. You're wasting your time going there. Most likely, you're, you're not going to get better or optimal if you're returning to sport or play. And that's a hard thing that people get frustrated with with general PT. And I know PTs mean well. It's just the learning system as we go through. So these techniques and exercises are going to go a long way. I use them with all of my athletes, my clients, runners, lifters, soccer players. And there's no different buckets. All of these are based on the human mechanics so they can work for any athlete. And a lot of them are geared at activating or strengthening smaller stabilizing muscles you know for example with the lower back usually it has to do with weak external rotators and then my my hips aren't and glutes aren't doing their job and my lower back kicks on to stabilize my spine and we do something as simple as like a clamshell exercise which i'm sure people are very familiar with or i'm having bands on my legs and i'm on the ground and i'm pulling one knee apart where I'm in this side plank position, I'm doing a clamshell and I'm activating. What's the exact muscle I'm activating? Well, so, so I'm not a big fan of clamshells and tell you the truth. There's a right way to do them and there's a wrong way. There's not a, it's not a bad exercise. I think obliques, you have to recruit oblique with the clamshell. I think a side plank clamshell hold like bar none. If, if I'm having lower back pain with somebody or, or hip pain, that will make it go away. And then having them squat with the band because then we have to get them into a loaded position. So they're overloading those muscles and they're making, they're getting a training effect out of it. So, okay. So you disagree with it, but what is that muscle? Well, I, 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 was, I don't disagree with it. I, I get a oh, oh. position. So oh, oh. if you have an extended back in that clamshell posture, which I see with it a lot, or even a lateral band walk that you're not going to do anything because the <laughs> glute maxes are already out of position from an external rotation position of a pelvis. So you're totally. not going to be able to access the range of motion. So you're going to have to revert to the lower back for stability because the pelvis can't move. And I think that's where people get in trouble when they just see these exercises and they're like, oh, I can mimic it. But it's very specific on what we're looking for from a spinal position. So I think the clamshell exercise is great, but I have to get you in the right position because then you're going to feel outside glute max as an external rotator fibers, you're going to get some bicep femoris as external rotators too, not just, hey, I'm just feeling TFL and IT band. Same right. thing with the lateral band walk. So it's, I never disagree with an exercise. I just want people to know that there's, there's exercises out there, but you have to be very careful how you perform them because I've totally. had people lie in sideline position and if their back is an extension, they're never going to get a glute max on when their leg goes into extension and behind them. But as soon as yeah. I get abs on, that outer glute will turn on. And you ask any runner out there, when I put them in that position, they'll feel their right glute max, and it's going to be a game changer for them. That's how you make sure that you're already feeling your core, your pelvic floor is on, and your glutes are engaged. So you're, you're already in a good position with your spine before you're turning these muscles on. And that should go, yeah, like, I mean, we could say that about really any exercise. Like, you can Google anything, but some of the nuances, that, that's kind of what the, the whole idea behind coaching is, is like AI is not going to be able to take over our jobs. I will argue that to, to the, the death. Like, it's, it's just not going to. Like, again, you can Google the best workout programs, Google the best protocols for XYZ, but progression, regression, nobody can do that except a human being watching and seeing things move. Because you can actually have like a functional scoliosis where, 
oh, as soon as I go to a standing position where I'm, I'm axial loading, now all of a sudden I'm having these bad movement patterns. So, you know, I, I think kind of piggybacking on Eric, you know, I don't, I don't have anything wrong with PTs, but PTs really don't know the body in motion all that well. And back to really quick, what I was saying here with the side plank clamshell, that exercise is going to help turn on these smaller muscles so that when I go to do a larger muscle pattern, like a squat, like a hinge, I'm going to recruit my glutes. If I can recruit my glutes into a hinge, well, now I'm actually engaging my core better. If I can't feel my glutes in a hinge, I will definitely not feel my core. The reason this is important is because we have seven primary movement patterns. And a lot of these little activation exercises are not part of our seven primary movement patterns. Again, they are there for turning on the smaller muscles so that when we do one of these seven primary movement patterns, we get a training effect and we reprogram the neuromuscular firing in our system. You, know, you have to remember that our, all of our muscle is connected together and we are one big holy system. So, you know, covering, covering the lower back, do we want to talk about some more exercises to specific exercises that you want to talk through about um, getting out of lower back pain and, and retraining for, for better yeah. firing? And I think you mentioned a, a good thing and people see this often or bands and balls and bands and balls are good things, but they're also bad things to a degree. Eventually you have to get away from using bands. And I think a, another one of my, I'm not going to disagree with it. One of my things I see gone too far is squats with bands around knees because people then become reliant from a neuromuscular standpoint on something pushing their knees in so they can push out against. We need to understand that when we're playing sports and doing other things that we don't have external load to press against us. That's one good thing that weight training allows us to do is understand external load, but we can't put a band around us when we're in the middle of a basketball game, be like, okay, here are my glutes. Eventually what people need to realize is they have to find time out, in time out position. Yeah. It's, it's one of those like, it's a good tool, but eventually you have to take them away. Just like supine and sideline, eventually you have to get someone upright. And that's yeah. a tricky thing because then people start losing sense because they become reliant on these things like bands and things between their feet or things in their hands that they need to touch that it needs to get progressively away. So in someone's even workout training program, I very rarely will put bands around after the second week because they need to find movement options with their own movement in their own body. I'm not going to make it so that literally every step you take, you're like actively thinking about what your hip and knee and ankle are doing. So you're making perfect steps all throughout your life. It's not about that. It's about you spend that all that cognitive present and presence energy when you exercise so that when you and overload properly so that when you go back to your regular living you can move freely without pain this is how you get out of pain it's not about a conscious like always fixing this this problem that you're going to always have but it's about correcting it in the right modality right sympathetic nervous system on training for an hour or 25 quality reps and then we've overloaded our nervous system and it's time to shut the nervous system down get parasympathetic for the next 24 hours and they can go again and each training you're like layering a new brick to better movement pattern, better neuromuscular firing so that you're not adding to the problem and you're getting your body to move without pain again. So, so really quick, like with lower back, I do like to start people on the ground. You know, we can do, we can do something. We'll start around the back stage of progression. I think that I'd like to go to is like a tabletop position. Hands and knees. We can do something simple as a cat cow to just get more mobility out of our spine, it's kind of a little spinal reset for alignment. And then I want to start doing things like a bird dog. It's hard to start training our core in this position so that when I go to stand and I do something that was usually causing my lower back pain, like looking to pick something up, my core is going to be more engaged to do that versus kind of falling back into old bad patterns. And I have this you know, 
despondent core, not responsive core, and then just adding to the lower back pain again. Yeah. And a lot of that stuff is, is I know we're said athletes, but athletes get things pretty good. I think it's more important that the general pop understands and finds and feels these movement options because they're the ones that are more disconnected from their body. Right. So it's, it's really paramount that where something like you're doing a glute bridge or all, um, let's say a bird dog that you're still feeling glutes and abs work because mm. if you don't, you're, I would tell you, you're just wasting your time. You're just going through the motions. And then any lift you do afterwards, it can be detrimental to that training program because you're not sensing things. And I think this is where a lot of people get, do get in trouble. It's far, It's hard. It's not easy. And that's why you said like, you do need a coach to have you understand what you're feeling and what you're going to sense. Cause just doing a, a squat with no tension is not going to get someone far and teaching someone how to understand the force tension relationship that we're looking for. You know, if it's, it's, if there's a lower back Which, exercise, there's going to be, it's going to be a crossover to knees and hips. You can use a lot of different techniques for knees and hips. Now the knee and hips are kind of tied together. Cause if you are going to have knee pain, it's probably a hip problem. Most likely same thing with the ankle. It's probably a hip problem, but to kind of work at the hips is you're going to try to focus on reposition the pelvis. Like that's goal number one. So whether you're standing, sitting, side lying. You have to find that position of, can you tuck under and sense glutes on? And at first, no movement is sometimes the best therapy to teach someone how to isometrically hold and control an inhale and exhale as they're moving through space with that breath, right? Because as we're breathing, we're still expanding rib cages and compressing organs. Sometimes with just breathing, people can't control that. So sometimes, sometimes too much movement is actually a bad thing, but the end goal is also get to movements. Now, if we have knee pain, let's say it's anterior knee pain, and most likely it's your quads are going to be tight because your hips are out of position, then you just focus on working that quad, glute, hamstring, ab. You should, you should be able to move freely through this range of motion without any knee pain. And, yeah, and that's and where people get it wrong because they take a concept that's good, but that's level like three or four, you got to do base level things first. And I think that's where a lot of people miss it. They're like, oh, knees go over toes. It's like, yes, but you have to have control yeah. position first of a right. pelvis, a hamstring, a glute. If you don't have that, you're just throwing garbage at, you know, at your program because you're going to end up getting back into over quad dominant things and you're going to lose knee pain. And, and that's a hard thing when it comes to this world of quick bites on Instagram, all you see is something like that. And you're like, oh, I got to go do that. And there's some person that really doesn't have the capability or the movement options to do it. They do it. They're going to actually hurt themselves more. So I always yeah. tell people, be very careful. But the end goal is, yes, your knee has to track over your toes with good foot mechanics. And eventually, yes, you can pick, pick your heel off because that's running. And shoot for your middle toe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I agree. Hips. And low back pain are pretty synonymous. And also with knee pain, there's a lot of carryover. There's a lot of has to do with just hip positioning, pelvic floor control, glute and core strengths together. But then another one that we could talk about is definitely neck. Neck is a little bit more related to shoulder and upper cross and lack of thoracic expansion. Yeah, then the next good one, because it's... it's it's funny because it's all tied to the axial skeleton. So you have a thorax is basically going to be your up top. And if that doesn't move or rotate, your neck is just another appendage. So you have two arms, two legs, you have appendages, and then you have this appendage with the neck. And it's going to house something that's very important, which is our brain. And everything reacts from the brain. So when the neck gets tight and we see neck pain, usually it's a sign of compression. That means you're losing movement options somewhere in the rib cage which means your yeah. shoulders are probably going to be absolutely junk. So I, when it comes to neck pain, I don't look at shoulders. I look at rib cage and I look at mandibles. So I look at people's teeth and what people's jaw is doing because that's going to tell you a lot what the neck is going to try to do around it because we need to have this lordotic curve of our cervical spine. And with nowadays, we're starting to really lose that with computers, forward head posture, lower backs that are too hyperextended push necks forward into a forward head posture and we lose position, we get tight anterior necks. So a lot of it is understanding then the breathing mechanics. 
So as people start to breathe, they use their neck muscles to pull ribs up to try to pull air in because they just don't have a right pattern. And this kind of comes with just being human, but then with poor activation of movement options. And we see this all the time. A lot of it with my population is when you do a rotation and your head and head and neck goes with the rotation, that can be a very bad thing because now you're using your vision and your neck to try to turn instead of your abs. So I tell people, swing, keep the head straight, and you're getting neck on thorax or thorax on neck rotation to allow for optimal movement. And you watch anyone in the gym do this with any sort of rotation, their eyes are going to go with their body. And we got to dissimulate that so they can start turning on top of each other. People forget that the head is still an extension of your spine and alignment is good strength. Like if I want to be a strong deadlifter or a strong squatter, like I don't want to be in this like collapsed position or this muted position. I want to be tall and I want to get to that tall position, especially if I'm coming up from like a clean, I want to eventually get big and there's no bad position except for the one you can't get out of. And usually neck pain stems from being able to get out of a position with your thorax. And, you know, a lot of what I see in general population, adding to what Eric's saying about computers and even carrying backpacks, like, geez, I remember learning later that you should only carry like 10% of your body weight in your backpack. I definitely broke that rule, you know, back in the day. But what you're doing is you're creating this upper cross and then you have this, this, this kyphosis in your back, this upper cross in your shoulders, and now you've lost all thoracic expansion. Really, the only reason I talk about shoulders is because it's the most easy way to understand this concept is I want my shoulder blade to stabilize to my rib cage. That's going to be like the platform. We talked about the, the hips and lower back. We talked about the pelvic floor. Think of the rib cage as like the pelvic floor of your upper body. If I can get that down, now my shoulder can articulate properly. And I'm not going to recruit things like the, the muscles in, in the neck and the, in the upper trap which just add to more tightness. So if I can, if I can stabilize, first of all, it's about getting open first, this thoracic expansion position. And then from there, my scapula being able to sit nicely on my rib cage, and then I should be able to get out of neck pain. And then we can talk about strengthening and overloading this, these positions so that I'm not always having to fix and wake up with knee pain or excuse me, neck pain. That could be knee pain too, right? Yeah, yeah necks, right, right. Necks are tight, right? And then, and I was pendulum theory. Yeah, right. You're, you're gonna have if necks are tight. I guarantee you, someone's abs are not working. I don't care if you have a six yeah. pack. If you got a tight neck, that means your abs aren't working as as exhalation muscles to control the rib cage. And when we have those ribs come too far into external rotation, you're gonna be kind of stuck. And that's where you do need, you know, to train the serratus anterior to pull that scap to the rib cage. And as you exhale, ribs need to go back. Kyphosis through the thoracic spine is a good thing. We need some degree of that. If you're too kyphotic, then that's going to lead to a flat cervical spine. Then you start seeing really kyphosis because someone's trying to use their anterior neck in position to find their abs. And that's not yeah. a good thing because then everything's going to become tight. Glossal muscles are going to get locked up. Teeth will get locked up. Things will start going right. You'll get TMJ, headaches. But a lot of it stems from the rib cage in having good postural control and breathing mechanics of abs and then allowing those shoulders to move. Because if you can create a neutral position to move left and right and forward back, you're going to have shoulder mobility. You're going to have range of motion. You're going to have movement options. And then you can free the neck because an unfree neck is not a free body. If you have a tight neck, there's no way that you're going to get anywhere close to having a body below that's going to be at its optimal performance. You're going to have compensatory mechanisms somewhere because you'll lock it up and you'll also lock up your sympathetic nervous system, which is going to put you in more of a high stress state constantly because you're just running on high drive. Again, the body's one big pulley system and we have this, this joint by joint theory. So there's, you know, a joint that's mobile is connected to a joint that's stable and, and so on and so forth. And then there's a pendulum theory where if I, in my center of mass, say the marker's the center of mass, and if my head moves forward to that center of mass, it means something else had to move behind that center of mass. So if I'm, if I'm having a, a forward neck position, 
odds are now my hips are in a bad position, my knees are in a bad position, and and my ankles would be in a bad position. So yeah, I mean, it, they, they, what's what's funny is you know sometimes people have multiple of these things going on. They're like, oh, what what should I start with? You got to do them all. You do. We literally are trying to do them all together to get out of these painful patterns and start to create new patterns that are going to create, you know, allow you to perform and feel good. And, you know, whether it's exercise or walk or get out of bed or play with your grandkids on the ground, you want to be able to do all those without pain. That's the goal. And if there's uh, there's one place to start, it's got to be the neck. You got to clear up the neck because that's runs the central nervous system. But if you have ankle pain, people, I always see this people start with the ankle. You're wasting your time. You always need to start at the core. You start with the pelvis and the thorax, and then you start going elsewhere. If you just do ankles and knees and shoulders, you're not going to get anywhere. And I think that's where a lot of people in the lens of VRI world understand. But in the non-PRI world, they don't because you're looking at it from a joint by joint position. It's like, oh, I'm just going to work on the hip. You know how many times, oh, the doctor said I had hip or, you know, tendonitis. Ooh, that's great. Well, I guarantee your pelvis is off and it's causing that. And there's a plethora of thing that's going to go. And usually as you go, you start taking away someone's pain, right? Or, or hurt their compensatory patterns are going to start putting that somewhere else. And you're going to follow the chain and it's either going to end up in the lower back or it's going to end up in the abs and obliques because it's a pelvis thorax issue at first. And so that's where people always need to start rather than starting from distal to proximal. And you're going to start strengthening that platform that we talked about that ne- that your scapula should be sitting on so that your your neck isn't doing the job of what your rib cage should be doing. And especially with the overhead press, you see this all the time, and even bicep curls, people extend their lower back. Extension of mm. the lower back will give you more range of motion, but it's not true range of motion. Now, some sports need that range of motion, and I'm okay with it. But we're, most of us are not in these sports where they need excessive back lordosis and they're just going to hurt themselves. So people get like, oh, yeah, I can go overhead, but they're like arching their back. Yeah, eventually it's just going to, you're just going to tear apart your shoulder and not get anywhere. So the rib cage position of an exhaled rib cage down and then moving to really allow serrage for upward rotation and movement, like that's the key. We yeah. see, it, especially in seated shoulder press, right? People will arch their back to get leverage and momentum. That's just not a good technique to have. And, and, so and that's why I, I hate, I hate, I, that's why I hate isolation work. And like literally everything we talked about today could be incorporated into one workout. Like you should be recruiting, you know, inhibiting your hip flexors, recruiting your glutes, your obliques, your, your pelvic floor, your core, you know, your, your, what's the word? Like your, your rib cage loading, like all these things play a role into your warm up so that when you're exercising, you're incorporating all these things. I'm not robbing Paul to pay Peter. I'm not pressing a weight overhead and forgetting all about my glutes and my core. No, that's why we started kind of with the center part because the core is the most important part, right? All the appendages attached to it. If I don't engage my core, it's like fire a cannon out of a canoe and I'm going to get injured or cause more pain. What I want to do is anchor everything down to my, to my core. And now any exercise I do, is going to help improve my neuromuscular firing in a structural way, in a functional way that's going to help you move without pain. So if you want to do a seated shoulder press with your back against a bench, I can shut your hip flexors off. I can turn your abs on. I can get knee pain to go away while training serratus and shutting the anterior neck down and moving away overhead because it's all due for, posi- due for position. If you get someone in the right position, I can make a bicep curl become a rehab exercise from shutting hip flexors and neck, flex, neck flexors off with a certain movement. And it's not really, if people heard bicep curl, it's not about the bicep itself. I'm just adding a movement to it. It's the position I'm putting someone in to allow them to move through space is what's going to inhibit and facilitate certain parts of the system. So every exercise can be a rehab technique if you want it to, just understanding the concepts. And that's where coaching becomes very prominent. And I think a lot of our clients stem towards our coaching because we go into that detail and because you need that detail if someone has a coach out there a trainer is like all right just do push-ups but i'm not really going to care where your scaps are on the rib cage or your pelvis is or your abs are they're not it's helping. pointless 
Yeah, so you it's, need it's to adding have, fitness on top of dysfunction. Right. And you're not going to get it with, yeah, you'll get stronger to a, a degree. But the end goal of our system is to flow in and out of certain states from parasympathetic to sympathetic, from rest, digest, to happy, to sad. Like we're supposed to go back and forth and certain things in this day of age just lock us up. So if you don't have that kind of insight into your body, like that's where we come in. That's where we can see what kind of movement patterns you have. We can take certain exercises, base exercises. Some people might consider them isolation exercises. Yeah, I don't like them either, but we can use them that they become more than just isolation exercise. They become a core, they become a breathing, they become an overhead movement all in one to understand how to move through space when you don't have weight. Yeah. 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 And just to kind of piggyback on that and wrap up here, you know, that's exactly what we as coaches do. You know, we've been doing this since 2012 and we pride ourselves on the ability to get into that nitty gritty detail to program for someone's warm up so that they are inhibiting the right muscles that make sense for them so that they're going to get the most out of their workout. And we always also incorporate some type of specific cool down function so that we are somewhat resetting the neuromuscular tension in our, that's left in our body, getting the parasympathetic mode and allowing our body to recover in a way that we don't have to stretch for an hour every day before our workout. We're trying to train for better instincts here. Um, and the goal is with, across the board between cardiorespiratory system, your neuromuscular system, your digestive system, your, your neuromuscular, or excuse me, your central nervous system, hormones, metabolism. We're trying to create synergy. So better connect, better product with all of them working together than just the sum of their separate parts. And yeah, there's anything, anything else you want to say to wrap up? You no, know, I, I think for a lot of it is just understanding that there's injuries, there's pain. It's going to take time to work through, but don't just do nothing because when you return to an activity, you're going to have that pain come back. You have to kind of attack what's nagging you and what's bothering you to understand and how to change that. That's the only way our human body learns. It's built for survival and you have to change a stimulus to get a different outcome. You can't just take something away and expect a different outcome to happen. I think a lot of people get in that mindset. Because some, that's just how the world works. You take out away a stimulus, something should just go away. I can repeat and go back to that same stimulus. But that's just not how the human body works. So be cognitive how you feel. A address what's going on, whether injury, hurt, tight, whatever that is, address it. And then you'll feel better and better as long as you keep addressing it and have the right programming. Think fitness lives. Signing off. Catch you next time. If you're ready All to right. make steps towards improving your health or increasing your performance, book a free 30-minute call today by visiting thinkfitnesslife.com.